Psalm chapter 11. If you'll join me there in your Bibles, I hope you will. If you need a Bible, there should be one in front of you in the back of the pew. And uh, you'll see up above me, the title of the message is simply this. America, the beautiful? Question mark, question mark, question mark. Sad to have to title a sermon like this, isn't it? But nonetheless, we are here today, and as holidays afford us a unique opportunity to focus, to contemplate, to turn our attention on a specific topic, subject, uh, we'll do that today. Very topical message, and uh, entitled such, and, and you'll see in a moment, I, I've taken some liberties today because it is a holiday and these unique opportunities. Psalm chapter 11, let's read it. David writes this, in a great uh, small psalm, but boy, full of powerful things that Oh, we'll get to in a moment. In the Lord put I my trust. How say you to my soul? Flee as a bird to your mountain. For lo, the wicked bend their bow. They make ready their arrow upon the string that they may privily shoot at the upright in heart. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold, his eyelids try, and the children of men. The Lord trieth the righteous, but the wicked. And him that loveth violence, his soul hateth. Upon the wicked he shall rain snares, fire and brimstone in a horrible tempest. This shall be the portion of their cup. For the righteous Lord loveth righteousness. His countenance doth behold the upright. This morning, I said I ta I've taken some liberties. Here's what I'm going to do and what I'm going to share with you. I've never done this before to my short-term memory <laughs> uh, that I remember, in my short-term memory, right? Uh, I've written an open letter to America for me. I'm going to share that with you today. And as an introduction uh, to this message, here's what it says. Dear America, as many of your citizens know by experience, it is never easy to stand by as a solemn observer as a loved one suffers through the agony of disease or endures the continuous, often slow strangling blows of the deathbed. Broken hearted and helpless seem totally inadequate expressions for, excuse me, inadequate words for the expression of what the heart feels when one we love deeply and strongly suffers in this way. I feel that way today and have for some time as I gaze upon our beautiful or once beautiful country. To be sure, America still retains some of her outward beauty as displayed across her gorgeous landscape, but the settled and quiet beauty is deceiving. For the heart, the soul, and mind of America is churning inside. Diseased and headed for complete and utter ruin at the hands of a corruption we have allowed to infiltrate this country for far too long. As the body of a loved one riddled with disease, tosses and turns as it writhes with the pain and havoc wreaked by disease on its way to sucking the very life out of the one we love, so are we witnessing the progressing demise of America today. Our nation is filled, filled with insensible violence, protest against the very people protecting us, Anger and hate, disdain, murder, and irrational self-mutilation. Is this really the land of the free and the brave? Is this what our forefathers suffered and died and bravely worked tirelessly to establish? I cannot and do not believe it. We have lost our secure moorings. We have wandered away in the sea of ambiguity and self-serving ambition. We have tossed the oars, the rudder, the compass, and the capital C captain overboard. And we wonder why we are not further along in our pursuit of the American dream in this experiment called America. We wonder why we are no longer free, but slaves to our own inability, our own ignorance, and our own failed attempts at a solution to all our ills. 
We have turned into the very thing our founding fathers escaped by boat as they took a perilous journey to come to a land that offered freedom and an escape from tyranny and an overreaching government. We have departed from the path and direction of our founding fathers that they set us on as a nation. And like a person who leaves a path in a forest and subsequently gets lost and hopelessly turned around and eventually, disappointingly, comes back to where they started with much pain, exhaustion, and despair, America, we find ourselves back where we started, worse off for the circular journey we have embarked upon. And all along the way, we have bought into, subscribed to hurtful, harmful, and dangerous ideas and beliefs derived from the sinful and deceitful hearts of people within and without this nation, having applied them with a broad brush upon our nation, causing unimaginable damage. I agree with the patriot Nathan Hell when he said simply this, I greatly fear some of America's greatest and most dangerous enemies are such as think themselves her best friends. Politicians, those in the media, so-called think tanks, the self-erected movers and shakers of this nation, and others who claim to want the best for America. But like the quack doctors who bled our first president to death in the name of the most advanced science and medical wisdom, America, you are being bled to death morally, spiritually, physically by those who claim to have your best interest at heart. What are your symptoms? What does the feeble presentation of you, America, look like today? Some might say you are the picture of progress, that we are presently going through what we are presently going through is but the birthing pains of a new and better nation, one in which every wrong is righted, every person feels like they belong, all are equal, cared for, and valued for who they are as never before. But beware, America. It can be said that to the uninformed ear, the cries of the birthing bed and the cries of the death bed are sometimes indistinguishable. Many Americans have bought into this erroneous view of our once great nation, thinking that the current pain is the necessary path of progress and future peace, but their eyes are closed. Their minds are numb. Their heads are in their sand. Their hearts are past feeling. They are blind to the reality that what they see and what they hear is a nation on its deathbed. What we see all around us is our nation. In our nation is not the pain of progress, but the depths of digression and decay, deterioration. We are neck deep in the quagmire of failed policies, painful politics, and the practice of everyone doing that which is right in their own eyes. America, your symptoms are many. Your ills, numerous. But certain ones consistently rear their ugly head and thereby solidify and secure the disease's stronghold on America. The sickness became apparent when several decades ago, America, you killed prayers in schools in the public square. We then subsequently did our best as a nation to remove God. We distanced ourselves with new verdicts and new decisions and new rulings that deemed the Ten Commandments, even the Ten Commandments, as religious rhetoric not wanted in our nation. Though the very same U.S. Supreme Court issued a decision in the 1800s that said that the Ten Commandments are good for our nation, should be displayed in our schools, and should influence and impact the character of our children. But not today. Today, modern America is systematically setting about to kill faith in God. As we have even witnessed our freedom together in worship as we see fit, threatened and taken away of late in the name of public good. America, for far too long, you have killed our young. In the name of personal rights and freedom and self-determination, personal choice, 
We discard our unborn, though living, future citizens with the trash of our everyday lives. No more wanted than a piece of useless and pointless trash. We are nearing an average of 800,000 babies murdered every year in the past few years in this nation. It is no wonder that the value of all life in America is the cheapest it has ever been in the minds of her citizens. America, you have killed marriage. You have taken the sacred institution from its God-given place of honor and reverence as the union between a man and woman for life and have relegated it to a cheap, easily dissolved civil contract between anyone of any sex or immoral lust that wants it. As one preacher recently so wisely put it, what happens to the original when, the, when any counterfeit comes along? It cheapens it. It devalues it. It erodes, excuse me, it erodes its standing. In America, marriage as God designed it is practically dead, if not on life support. America, you have killed personal responsibility especially of that to God. To be held accountable is no longer what we, we practice. Dismiss with the emphasis on being who you are and doing whatever you want to do at all costs without regard to the consequences. We have taken and implied to our culture some of the ridiculous parenting methods that were pushed in the late 1900s in which we were encouraged to cater to children to their fleshly tantrums and demands. When we were told not to, uh, we were told to spoil the child, not discipline them. Give in to their demands and fleshly fits so that we don't damage their ego or hurt their self-esteem or stunt their growth into adults. And so today, we have adult pre- protesters acting like children mutilating and destroying this country, attacking the innocent, reviling the very servants trying to serve and protect, being nothing more than a spoiled group of citizens to whom we cater to and give in to, hoping something along the way will appease them. Yet I fear they will not be appeased until America as we know it is dead. America? You say you want unity and freedom and to be one nation again? Yet the actions you commit, the steps you take, go contrary to unity and healing. Just this week, it was leaked that the NFL would play a separate, quote-unquote, black anthem before the week one games of this upcoming season. Instead of the national anthem. So let me understand this correctly. You believe we will promote and gain unity and oneness through further erecting a divide and difference within our populace by giving us separate anthems? Will we adopt an anthem for every ethnicity in America now? Last I checked, the national anthem of the United States of America was designed to unify us, not divide us. It speaks of the great sacrifice that was given to make America great by many citizens of every color. It represents what we want as a nation, though not necessarily what we are. It speaks of the unified dream and hope of all Americans, regardless of our ethnicity or nation of origin. It speaks of the sacrifice of so many through the years and our renewed commitment to fighting for the once great nation to ensure her freedoms and her preservation all while confirming our trust in God as the one who must watch over her and protect her. But now, even this once revered expression of the true American dream is being reviled, disrespected, cast aside, and used as a political pawn. America, you are sick, diseased, and close to the point of no return. You're in need of some strong medicine preceded by necessary surgery. We must put away what is killing you. 
The problem simply stated is this. There is no longer a president or congress that resides and rules over you, America. You have ceased to be a republic or even the democracy some have confused you with at times. You have become the very thing that a repulsion to is credited for your birth as a nation so many years ago. America is ruled by a tyrant, a ruthless, evil monarch who will not easily relinquish power and rule. Is that the current president, you ask? No. Is that one or the other of our political parties? No. Is that Congress? <laughs> no. Is that a rogue governor? I will not answer. No, just kidding. No is the answer to that. Is that the ravenous media spewing falsities more than truth? No. This tyrant, this tyrant is one who has ru ruined and ruled many a nation and civilization down throughout the years of history. See, America's tyrant is nothing more than the sinful nature of every man. America's tyrant is nothing more than its sinful flesh and nature. And that nature is strong and at work in every person. Many a historical civilization rose and eventually fell, even as the Bible records about some of them within its sacred pages. Why? Because the human nature, yea, our sinful nature, was given free reign. It has been established as king of the land, every man doing that which is right in his own eyes. And so, America, you find yourself today a land ruled by a terrible tyrant, man's sinful nature. The forecast is not good. Many more storms and much destruction lay ahead. If your course is not altered, the death of America will be inevitable. Many, many years ago, Thomas Paine wrote a book entitled <laughs> Common Sense. In this book, he pointedly spoke to the ills of that day that moved men and women, our founding fathers, to establish America as a nation. In it, he made a statement that I believe points to the only medicine that can cure America today. Here is what he wrote in that day. He said this, But where, say some, is the king of America? I'll tell you, friend, he rules above. He reigns above and doth not make havoc of mankind like the royal brute of Britain. Oh, there's a far better source than even Thomas Paine. In Psalm chapter 33, verse 12, the Bible simply says, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. There's a tyrant in America. It's the sinful human flesh. We need to return to our king. We need to go back and put God on the throne. Any other ruler and king than the God of heaven will indeed wreak havoc in mankind. And that is what the sinful nature of man is doing in you, America, even this day. It is my prayer for you, America, that you would have no other God but the God of heaven. No other king than the king of kings. And no other savior than the one name under heaven given among men whereby you must be saved. Jesus Christ is his name. There is but one hope for you, America, and it is not something, it is someone, Jesus Christ. America, you will never solve inequality apart from Jesus Christ. America, you will never see unity among your citizens apart from Jesus Christ. America, you will never experience true prosperity apart from Jesus Christ. America, you will never enjoy freedom and liberty apart from Jesus Christ. My friend, America, it is time to cry out to God for help. It's time to turn to the only answer for all that ills you. America, you need Jesus Christ. With all my prayers and hope for your recovery, Pastor Stephen Henry. I appreciate you letting me share open letter. I understand <laughs> there may be some of you who uh, don't share in my sentiment. It may, on the other hand, represent the sentiment of your heart in full or in part. You might consider me an alarmist. 
make things sound too desperate, too political. Or you might agree with what I have shared in full or in part or not at all. But the question given by David in verse number 3 of Psalm 11 must be asked as we are citizens of America even today. What can the righteous do? What can the righteous do? What can those who are saved and believers, what, what can they do in the face of this? Should we flee to the mountains? That's what verse 1 says. Oh, fl- so flee to the mountains. Uh, uh, there was a church member who was joking with me about what's going on in America, and they're like, so when you were out west, did you find any place that we might be safe if we have to go to? <laughs> we haven't had to go start a colony. I think that's been tried and failed. But anyway, uh, go start something. I mean, do we flee? Do we run away? Do we, do we just kind of hide? I mean, do we just kind of protect and, and do... That's our response. Should we hide our heads in the sand? Pretending it isn't as bad as it really is. Should we just do nothing and, and hope for the best? Should we say, hey, that's, that's not our fight. That's none of our business. Now, may I just interject something here? If you believe the real history, not the reconstructed history of America, you would go back and understand that it is impossible to stop or to separate America from faith in God. So therefore, if you tell me as a Christian, now listen, Christian, be quiet. You ought not to speak up. You ought not to, you ought not to stand up for freedoms and liberty and, and the, 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 the demise of America. You ought not to do that. That's, that's not our fight. You need to just stick to the faith. May I tell you, America and faith is inseparable. It was started on faith. Founding fathers that trusted in God. My friend, you, it's just like offering me water but separating the H from the O. Here's the O. Wait a minute. That's not water. My, t- my friend, may I tell you, America without faith is not America. And if she is worth fighting on a physical battlefield to the veterans who are here and those who serve today, my friend, she is worth fighting for as a Christian, the faith that it was founded upon. So don't tell me. Stay, no, be quiet. Don't say anything. We just need to sit back. And if socialism happens, it happens. If this happens, it happens. My friend, that... With all respect, that ain't being a good Christian in America. Speak up. Stand up. Because, my friend, when you and I defend the faith, we're defending what America was founded upon. David said, if the foundations be destroyed, and my friend, I'll tell you, the foundation is crumbling. So what do we do? How do we work hard at restoring it and getting back? Well, in response to that question, we see that there's a call that echoes out to every believer this morning on this July 4th weekend, a call that has not changed, whether it be to the believers in Israel at the time when they were going away from God too. It remains the same. May I put before you that we are called to a constant remembrance and continual action. See, David starts with this idea of constant remembrance. In verse number four, he tells us to do this. Remember, the Lord is still on the throne. The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. I am encouraged by this, aren't you? I know we're in a a, a political year in which there's a a big election and so forth, but I am encouraged by what this verse tells us because here is literally what it's saying. The throne of heaven that God sits upon will last well beyond the halls of Congress and the desk in the White House. He's still on the throne. He will always be on the throne. He and his rule is everlasting. America and her human rulers will someday cease to be what they are today. But his rule is everlasting. So David encourages his own soul as he encourages you and I today. Trust in the ruler, God of heaven, the ruler of every age and of all time. Look at verse 5 and 6. Notice it. The Lord trieth the righteous, but the wicked and, and him that loveth violence his soul hateth. Upon the wicked he shall rain snares and fire and brimstone and a horrible tempest. This shall be the portion of their cup. Verses 5 and 6, they remind us or uh, tell us to remember that the Lord is still the judge of the whole earth. He sees all. He knows all. He will make all right in his perfect timing. We may lose the battle for America, but we will win the battle for the world in righteousness. Why? Because we are on the right side. So keep fighting. Don't despair. Judgment is guaranteed. All will be made right. 
So just remember, he is still the judge of the whole earth. Verse number seven. For the righteous Lord loveth righteousness. His countenance doth behold the upright. And I like this one. You know what David reminds us? He says this. Remember that the Lord still loves righteousness. The world around us may be falling apart and wickedness may be highlighted and celebrated and sin and evil may be, may be just pushed down our throats and in our faces. And yet the fact is we need to remind ourselves that God desires righteousness on earth among all people. He delights in the righteous while hating the wicked and those that love violence. Don't think for a moment that God's estimation of righteousness has changed. That he has settled for putting up with the wickedness and the sinfulness of America and the rest of the world. That righteousness is of any less importance to him. He is a holy and righteous God who will one day stand in judgment of the whole world. And he still wants you and I to be holy, righteous before him. May I tell you, you know what he wants for America? He wants America to be righteous. He does. It's worth fighting for. This constant remembrance, these things we ought to remember, ought to encourage us and lift us up. And it ought to also move us to a continual action. What is that continual action? Well, God's word really makes it clear, doesn't it? We were in Jude last Sunday, and boy, this is a great verse. We didn't look at it, but from Jude, the only chapter, verse number three. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly, intensely, passionately contend for the faith which was delivered unto the saints. I just tell you this morning, you know what you and I ought to be moved to in reading Psalm 11, where America is? We ought to be earnestly contending for the faith. Contend for the faith. Now, more than ever, we must fight for the faith getting it out there. May I just put it this way? The more America removes it, the more you and I should add it. That's what light does. The darkness wants to spread. Guess what? We're going to share more and spread more light. We're going to give it. Contend for the faith. Social media, the workplace, our families, our neighborhoods, and in our cities, contend for the faith. We are at the point where we must fight for the inclusion of faith. We must fight for every inch of ground we have lost over the years. We must fight for the freedom to tell anyone and everyone, Jesus Christ died for you. God in heaven loves you, and you must repent of your sins today. Are you earnestly doing this, Christian? Jude says, you and I must earnestly contend for the faith. May I tell you what America needs today? It's Christians who earnestly contend for the faith. It does. Number two, Romans chapter 10 and verse 1. Paul's writing, we've studied it on Wednesday nights. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. May I tell you, we must contend for the faith, but number two, we must care through prayer. We must care through prayer. Every American needs Jesus Christ. They need to be saved. Every protester needs Jesus Christ. Every police officer needs Jesus Christ. Every felon needs Jesus Christ. Every politician needs Jesus Christ. Every member of Black Lives Matter needs Jesus Christ. Every member of Antifa needs Jesus Christ. Every white supremacist needs Jesus Christ. The need does not change, but my friend, that need is as great as ever. America needs Jesus Christ. And where we start, oh, we contend for the faith, but my friend, you need to care for every person, every American through prayer. Praying for their salvation. Paul prayed for the nation of Israel to come back to God. Jesus Christ himself prayed for Jerusalem to turn back to God. You and I must care for America through our prayers. A true patriot would do that if you're a Christian. Pray for those in government and authority over us, along with the common man in the streets. Pray for truth to be heard in the midst of all the negative, false rhetoric that is out there in abundance. Pray for truth to come shining through. Pray for the one thing that can save America the salvation of her citizens. Contend for the faith. 
our rights and our freedoms to worship and uphold God and to preach Jesus Christ, then care through our prayers. And then number three, could I encourage you to once again commit to the commission? Commit to the commission. We know that Matthew 28 speaks of our great calling, our commissioning by God to tell of Christ and to teach others about him. My friend, we must anew commit to this, now more than ever. It's what our 2020 vision is all about. It's why Paul wrote in Romans 13, 11, for such a time as this, and that, knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. You know what time it is? It's time to awake and take action before it's too late. America is on that deathbed. And yet, even as we spoke last week, there's still hope for America. Would you listen carefully as I conclude the message? There was ever a time for Christians to put aside the unimportant and to focus on the Great Commission here in America? It is right now. It is right now. Our commitment level should be as great as it has ever been. May I encourage you, Christian in America, awake and shake off the distractions and noise of this pandemic and anything else in life. Commit anew to the commission of our God. Awake and shake off the indifference of a comfortable life. Commit anew to the commission of our God. Awake. And shake off the lies. The lies that you can't do anything or shouldn't do anything about what is going on in America today. Commit anew to the great commission of our God. May it not be said that in the time of America's greatest need, we stood by and did nothing. When you and I have the answer for America's greatest need, contend for the faith. Care through prayer. Commit to the commission. Will you today, Christian? Because I want to tell you something. Those of us who are older, those of us who've studied history, you might remember a poster that says, America needs you. Or Uncle Sam needs you. May I tell you today, Christian, America needs you. You're the hope. Contend for the faith. Care through prayer. And my friend, commit to the commission. And remember, when all is said and done, our God is still on the throne. He will judge. And my friend, it will be a great day when you and I are in his kingdom.